Hi, my name is Dr. Errol Zdaga. I'm a doctor at Stanford School of Medicine, a hospitalist, and also a member of the Stanford Medicine 25. The purpose of this video is to teach you the approach to looking at your patient's retina. Normally, we think of eye doctors as the ones who are looking in patient's retinas. However, if you're taking care of a patient, we want you to also be comfortable doing the same thing. So that's the purpose of this video. So let's get started. Before we can do anything else, we have to talk about the equipment. Usually we use direct ophthalmoscopes. Indirect ophthalmoscopes are the type of gear that the eye specialists wear on their head. These direct ophthalmoscopes come in a couple different forms and two of the most common ones I'm holding in my hands. You have the traditional one here and also the panoptic. For the purpose of this video, we're gonna be mostly sticking with the panoptic because one, it's easier to use and two, it has a greater uh, field of view. Now I should also mention, while we'll go over the mechanics of using the panoptic, it's essentially the same thing as this ophthalmoscope as well. And we'll talk about that in a second. Now, for the ophthalmoscope, there's three main things to know. The first one is light or brightness. So for the brightness, all you need to do is press the little button and twist it. And the more you twist it, the brighter the light will become. There's two things to remember when dealing with brightness. Number one, the brighter you make it, the more pupil constriction you may get if you're not using a dilator. And number two, the brighter it is, the more painful it'll be for the patient, so you won't be able to visualize the retina as long. The second thing to know about the ophthalmoscope is this carousel setting right here. And this carousel setting allows you to change the different types of light coming out of the scope. So the most important thing to know is this green line here. This green line will provide a medium-sized circle, which is what I recommend most people use. If you slide the green line to the right or to the left, you'll get varying sizes of that circle, a larger one or a smaller one. The purpose of that is simply if the patient's more dilated or more constricted, you can adjust the light as needed. You'll also see here a tiny slit lamp to look for variations in contour. The second thing you can also see is a blue cobalt filter. Certain scopes have that, certain come with that, and certain don't. So you're, if yours has that, it allows you to look at abrasions on the cornea if you add a fluorescein dye. There's a green light that comes out, and that's the red free filter. The purpose of that is to see better contrast on the red blood vessels in the back of the retina. The third and final setting to know about the panoptic is regarding these numbers here. The purpose of this third setting is to focus if you, the healthcare provider, or your patient is too nearsighted or too farsighted. This setting can actually be used to figure out what your prescription is. All you have to do is look through the scope at something about 10 to 15 feet away and move this knob until it comes in focus. And if it comes in focus a little bit towards the red setting, that's actually your prescription in diopters for someone who's nearsighted or having difficulty seeing far away. One other thing to remember is that the panoptoscope is actually very similar to the more traditional direct ophthalmoscope. This knob here correlates very well with this knob here. And this setting here that you adjust for nearsighted and farsighted is very similar to this one here. Same idea otherwise. One last thing to mention, if you're, if you're a healthcare provider and you're very nearsighted and you have to adjust this for yourself, usually you don't have to worry about the patient being nearsighted or farsighted with the panoptic. Unless they're extremely nearsighted or farsighted, you actually can set it for yourself and not touch it again. For this scope, you may have to adjust it more for the patient. That's another advantage of this scope. So before we start the demonstration, I need to make sure that this setting is adjusted for my vision. So I look at something about 10 to 15 feet away and make sure it's in focus. After that, it's very unlikely I need to touch this setting again. Unless the patient's extremely nearsighted or farsighted, you usually can set it for yourself and not have to worry about it again. If you have 20-20 vision or you have contacts in that leave you to have 20-20 vision, you actually don't have to do anything other than leave it right at the zero. So we have Jocelyn here and we're gonna be examining Jocelyn's right now. So if you're using the panoptic, it comes this little cup here which allows you to go as close as you want without worrying about running into the patient's eye. If you're gonna use this, I recommend maybe just putting it on the patient and getting them used to it so they're not flinching the first time you look in the eye. So to do that, we're actually gonna use an additional adapter called the eye examiner, which allows us to attach an iPhone to the panoptic and take video images or uh, stills of her retina. And the great thing about it as well is it's great for teaching. You can tell if somebody actually is looking at the retina when they're going in there. So to do that, all we do is simply turn on the phone, make sure the setting here is at zero, and we leave it at the green setting, the medium-sized circle. Turn the video on and turn on the light. So the other important thing to keep in mind 
is patient positioning. Whenever you're looking at someone's retina, you have to make sure that your positioning of the ophthalmoscope is equal to their height of their eyes, whether they're sitting or standing. And sometimes they need to be sitting or standing to make the right position, especially if you're a different height of your patient. So you wanna make sure you're at the same height of them. And what I usually ask the patient to do is to, if I can ask you to take your thumb and stick it straight out ahead of you, great. So I'll have her stick her right thumb out if I'm gonna look in her left eye. And the next thing I'm gonna do is making sure my level is the same height. I'm gonna come about 15 degrees from center and look for something called the red reflex. The red reflex is important for two reasons. It tells you that basically from the camera of this phone all the way to the back of a retina is intact. There's nothing obscuring that, such as a cancer in the back of the retina, like a retinoblastoma if your patient's young, or a cataract blurring the, the lens. The second thing is it tells you that your angle is perfect for actually visualizing, visualizing the retina. So the last thing to do is simply go in and visualize the retina. You just go in and follow that red reflex. If you lose the red reflex, no problem. Just come back, find the red reflex, and go back in again. And you get closer and closer and closer. So you see it there. You can see the optic disc and a little bit of the bright optic cup within the optic disc. And you can see the patient's blinking, which is very common. Sometimes they get uncomfortable and you lose the view, no problem, come back again. Jocelyn's doing great, but I just want to demonstrate that sometimes you lose it. Excellent, same thing, come back in there and visualize the optic disc, just like that. Perfect. Now a couple of things to remember. Uh, when we're going in, we're looking, we're going straight for the optic disc. The optic disc is the best place to visualize because number one, it'll, it can be associated with a lot of pathology, a lot of med medical pathology. And number two, there's no rods or cones there, so it's going to cause the least amount of pain and least amount of pupil constriction if you're focusing the light in that area. If you want to visualize other aspects of the retina, for the panoptic, you simply have the patient look a little bit up to see up have them look down to see down, medial to see medial, and lateral to see lateral. Lastly, if you're trying to visualize the fovea or macula, you have them look directly at the light. So now let's talk about abnormal findings. By far and away, when you're looking at the optic disc, one of the important things you want to look for is optic disc blurring. Optic disc blurring in the setting of increased intracranial pressure is referred to as papilledema. Papilledema can be caused by anything that causes increased pressure in the brain, such as brain tumors, pseudotumor cerebri, sinus thrombosis, hydrocephalus, meningitis or encephalitis, malignant hypertension. It should also be noted that while optic neuritis causes optic disc blurring that's caused by inflammation of the optic nerve, not from increased pressure in the brain. Other abnormal findings you can see in the retina include Roth spots, as you see here, caused by a patient presented to Stanford with endocarditis, uh, hypertensive and diabetic retinopathy, and cholesterol emboli, also known as Holland Horse Plaque. Well, that's it. Thanks so much for watching the video. Please join us at the Stanford Medicine 25 website to learn more on the retinal exam and a whole host of other bedside exam techniques. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.